Okay, Thank you. Now, now it's official. Uh, a few brief remarks. Uh, our next and barring unforeseen circumstances, our final lecture of spring 2008 will take place this coming Monday, June 9th at 7.30 p.m. when Dr. Rasmik Panosyan will give a lecture entitled Change Without Transition, Politics in Post-Soviet Armenia. This event will be co-sponsored by the Armenian Relief Society Summer Youth Program and Nasser. Uh, and participants in the Summer Youth Program will be at the lecture, so I hope you will come as well and mingle with the youth, as it were, and hear a, uh, what I'm sure will be a very interesting talk by Razmik Panosya, who spoke a couple of years ago here at our annual assembly. Uh, I know we're behind schedule, but a couple of other things. It's been a almost unprecedentedly busy half year for Nasser in the area of programs and lectures. From the January 25th commemoration of the first anniversary of the assassination of Harant Dink, held at the Western Diocese of the Armenian Church in Burbank, down to tonight and next Monday's talk by Bloxham and Panosian, we've held 16 lectures in eight cities and five states. The lectures have covered the Armenian Genocide, Armenian Merchant Networks, Ancient Armenian Kings, Armenian Art and Architecture, Armenian Studies in Jerusalem, and so on. So I would like to ask those of you who are here, since we have a nice full house, and thank you for coming, those of you who have regularly attended lectures here, to let other people know who do not come regularly that this lecture series affords a unique access to, the who's who, to a who's who from the world of Armenian studies and beyond the world of Armenian studies. There are many fine Armenian institutions in this area and in other areas of the country, but no other institution offers the scope of public programs that Nasser does. Please help us by spreading the word about this, by becoming a member if you are not a member, or continuing to be a member if you are already a member, or helping us with your contributions, because this is going to come as a shock to everyone here. <laughs> These things do cost money. Uh, with the upsurge in uh, events comes a commensurate upsurge in expenses. So we ask for your help in doing our continued and hopefully continually expanding work. Okay, thank you. Uh, on to the reason we're here tonight. There's a line from an old blues song, if it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. Um, and it's kind of been like that with uh, Professor Bloxham, who is here. You may remember back in December, we were supposed to be here to hear Professor Bloxham, but instead we had a blizzard. Uh, this afternoon, I got a desperate phone call from Professor Bloxham that his flight from Washington, D.C. had been canceled, uh, and he was making arrangements to get here, which through partially miraculous conditions and circumstances, he is. Uh, so Professor Bloxham is the, uh, currently the J.B. and Maurice C. Shapiro Senior Scholar in Residence at the U.S. Holocaust Museum. He is Professor of Modern History at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, he is the youngest full professor in the history of the United Kingdom. Wow. Which is pretty amazing. He is the winner of numerous prizes and honors for his work, including most recently, last year, the Raphael Lemkin Award for Genocide Scholarship for his outstanding book, The Great Game of Genocide, Imperialism, Nationalism, and the Destruction of the Ottoman Armenians. And yes, of course, it's for sale in the bookstore. He is also the author of Genocide on Trial, War Crimes, Trials, and the Formation of Holocaust History and Memory, the Holocaust Critical Historical Approaches, and the forthcoming Genocide, the World Wars, and the Unweaving of Europe. He is the author of many articles and is on the editorial board of four very prestigious genocide studies journals. And I have kept you waiting long enough and Professor Bloxham. So please welcome Professor Donald Bloxham. has explained the circumstances of my rather belated arrival. Um, so do forgive me if I'm a little bit 
fluster for the first few minutes. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, at long last, at the second, second attempt, almost the third attempt. I, um, one of the very good things about speaking to Armenian audiences is that you don't really need to lay out in advance the significance of the subject about which I'm going to talk. I hope you don't mind if I take for granted a certain knowledge of the Armenian Genocide itself, um, the significance of that event obviously, and also the significance of its contemporary denial. I think it was the fact of um, genocide denial and its acceptance in the international community uh, that drew me to the subject in the first place. And uh, as I investigated denial, um, a typically Western accommodation of the uh, agenda of the Turkish state in denying the Armenian genocide, I think I became interested in not only how th those dynamics work, the dynamics of denial, but how the dynamics of interaction between Turkey and the West um, actually had very considerable similarities with the interaction between the Ottoman Empire and the West in the generations leading up to the genocide itself. The point of my book is, is, is really to, to elucidate some of the considerable historical continuities through the 19th and the 20th centuries up to the present in the interaction between um, the Ottoman Empire, then Turkey, and the outside world. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So there will actually be almost nothing on the events of 1915 to 16 themselves. I'm not going to talk about the genocide. What I'm going to talk about is uh, as I see it, the responsibility um, of the outside world and the dynamic leading up to genocide, um, the responsibility, culpability, role of the great powers during the genocide itself, and the, um, some of the politics of denial and the accommodation of denial afterwards. I think it's important to say here that um, the Armenians will only appear in my, the Armenian people will only appear in my lecture as the, somehow the objects of great power policy. This is very much how they were perceived in the 19th 20th, and 20th centuries. You know, there'll be very little about Armenians themselves, more about how they've been objectified, instrumentalized by um, the bigger powers in the world, particularly the European system. In a way too, the Ottoman Empire is instrumentalized. And I'll, I'll expand on what I mean by that. Um, the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century is an increasingly weak empire. Of course, hugely strong relative to its own minority populations, but relatively weak and increasingly weak in the international power system. When one talks about the interaction of the great powers with the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, one is not really talking about an interaction of equals. One is talking about an interaction of stronger and weaker powers. And this, I think, is very significant in developing a kind of um, victim mentality in the late Ottoman state, which in turn drives it to become a perpetrator of genocide. It is very significant. And when we're talking about the relations between the outside world and the Ottoman Empire, it's not just a question of normal inter international relations. This is a question of, of some sort of more formal instrumentalization. A greater um, influence played by the outside world on the Ottoman Empire than you might expect in normal international relations. Two examples to, would suffice to illustrate that point. In the aftermath of the um, so-called Eastern Crisis of 1875 to 8, the Ottoman Empire, more and more heavily indebted to, to particularly Britain and France than it has been um, since really the Crimean War, when the, when the Ottoman debt to the outside world really starts to build. In 1881, the Ottoman so-called Ottoman Public Debt Administration is established, effectively giving a considerable proportion of uh, Ottoman tax raising powers to uh, Britain and France in particular very considerable um, imposition on the sovereign prerogatives of the Ottoman Empire, showing the strength of um, Western influence in Istanbul. The second example to show the strength of the Western, of Western influence within Ottoman politics. Um, I'm thinking here of the great Armenian massacres of 1894-6. to um, During this period, in 1895, the British Prime Minister Salisbury says in all seriousness to one of his um, closest aides that in light of the massacres and the fact that of, you know, in further evidence of the, of the victimization of the Armenians within the Ottoman Empire, uh, the, amb the British ambassador at Istanbul should be advised that a change of sultan might be a desirable expedient. 
No, this is very significant, isn't it? I mean, Britain by that point is actually not in the position to influence that sort of thing. But the very fact that that we that this is already sort of passed into British Parliament, so you can talk about changing a sultan with the snap of your fingers, um, you know, is a very significant indicator of the of, of the sense of the power differential between those between the, 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 the European powers and the Ottoman Empire. So that is the background for me talking about the, the, like what I would call the co-responsibility at some level of the great powers in the changing dynamic that leads to genocide. Now I need to be clear about this because quite obviously the perpetrators of genocide is the late Ottoman elite, the Committee of Union and Progress, which comes to power in 1908. Um, and some of the organs of the, of the, of, of the Ottoman state. The, these are the perpetrators with whom criminal responsibility, legal responsibility lies. And I would differentiate between that sort of responsibility, which lies entirely with the late Ottoman elite, that sort of responsibility on one hand, and on the other hand, what you might call the broader ambit of historical responsibility. And this is where I think we can start to talk about the um, the four great powers, well, the three great powers on whom I'm going to particularly focus today, uh, Britain, uh, Russia, and Germany, all playing a part uh, in the exacerbation of state minority relations in the late Ottoman Empire. The reason I think it's important to, to, to focus upon the, the culpability of these powers is because I think when one's looking at the complex interaction and causation of historical events, it's important to remember that you know, morality, as it were, guilt, is not some sort of finite quantity. You know, it's not some, some quantity which has to be subtracted from one party and the extent it's added to another. You know, the, 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 the guilt of the Committee of Union and Progress is not diminished by reference to the responsibility of other parties. You know, there's no finite quantity to guilt and responsibility in that sense. And I think the most important piece of evidence, and, and, and really the building block of today's lecture, would be, would be the observation that um, with the greater influ influence that the great powers have in Ottoman affairs through the 19th century, particularly towards the end of the 19th century, um, there's a real coincidence of the great powers' interest in the Armenian question and the exacerbation of the Armenian, uh, Ottoman Armenian dynamic. The Ottoman state only becomes murderous of Armenians on a large scale in the aftermath of what we might call the internationalization of the Armenian question at the Treaty of Berlin in 1878. I think this is really a seminal moment in late Ottoman history. It's only after that question, only after the Armenian question has been brought to the international table, Armenians are mentioned in that capacity for the first time in an international treaty, that we start to see real suspicion of the state towards the Armenian community itself. And we'll look in a few minutes at why the Armenians appear in that treaty uh, and why that's such a cause for suspicion and why I think the powers who bring the Armenians into that treaty, particularly Britain, have a considerable moral culpability in, in raising the issue in the way in which they do. So it's, I think really the, the, the focus of this paper is on what you might call the internationalization of the Armenian question and aspects pursuant to that and how the genocide developed out of that partly part, um, and how that, that, that idea of interaction between Armenians, the Ottoman state, and the great powers goes on into the, through the genocide period and into the aftermath of the genocide period to also shape the politics of denial. So really, the first part of my paper will concern the interaction between Britain and Russia, the most important power, external powers in the arbitration of the Armenian question for most of the 19th century. Then I'll look a little bit more briefly at Germany, the third power that becomes influential in the Armenian question at the very end of the 19th century and through the First World War itself. And then I'll look at the United States and the way that American Near Eastern agendas um, fit into the pattern already established by Britain and Russia and by Germany. <coughs> Bears repeating that none of these powers really should be thought of as being pro-Ottoman, pro-Turkish, or pro-Armenian. You know, this isn't really how it works. You know, this question of which, you know, you don't, you know, you know not, Britain is not intrinsically pro-Ottoman. It's pro-Ottoman when it wants to be in the interest of its, its own foreign political strategy. Likewise, whenever Armenians, in some sense, are favoured by the great powers, that's 
purely an instrumentality also. So we need to get out of our minds, I think, the idea that certain states are intrinsically pro-Turkish and certain states are intrinsically pro-Armenian. This is just not true. It's, it's, it's not true even of Germany, the power with which I think well, most often it's been associated with the genocide. I would say that you know, there's not really anti-Armenianism there, but I'll come to that shortly. So Britain and Russia, well, in the aftermath of the defeat of Napoleon, um, in the aftermath of 1815, Britain and Russia really become the, the arbiters of continental affairs, certainly within, you know, within the European power system. One can think, I think, of um, a political competition. For the purposes of this lecture, the most important aspect of that political competition, a uh, geopolitical competition, concerns Central Asia, uh, particularly the land routes to India. Britain, with dominion in India, ever concerned about the land routes to India, um, the Russian Empire expanding southwards and eastwards uh, at a huge rate throughout the 19th century, endeavours to be coming into conflict with British communication groups to India, through Persia, through Central Asia. And I think you know, that, that's a, that, that competition, you know, the great game for hegemony in Central Asia is really, I mean, that's, that's what led the title to my book, this allusion to the imperial politics of this whole, this whole affair. But this is also very important in a knock-on way um, for the Armenian question, purely as a matter of geography, really. The majority of the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, of course, living in eastern Anatolia, proximity to the Caucasus, but also to, the, uh, to Persia, a very important communications route for Britain, um, a very important area, a sphere of British interest, increasingly of Russian interest. Very important for Britain to minimize Russian interest in Eastern Anatolia as to minimize Russian interests and influence in Central Asia. So when we start to see both of those powers tinkering with the Armenian question in the later 19th century, I think you know, at the back of their minds, particularly the British mind, is this question of you know, what, what will Russia, extended Russian influence over the Christian population of Eastern Anatolia mean for our regional hegemony, particularly regards, regarding imperial communications. Of course, Russia is, has, for some time up to that point, for at least the previous hundred years from the late 19th century, been making considerable overtures to Ottoman Christians, playing on religious confraternity, playing on some sort of sense of, of togetherness as a way of forming its own agenda of keeping the Ottoman Empire weak. Whether that be appealing to Orthodox Christians in the Balkans, stimulating Christian secessionist nationalism in the Balkans, uh, or, or appealing to Armenian sentiment in Eastern Anatolia as a way of keeping the Ottoman Empire. That's one of the one of the more famous Russian statesmen. I think um, it may have been Sergei Sazonov, the, the foreign minister um, around the First World War period, said that having a weak, enfeebled Russia as a neighbour was the next best thing to having no neighbour at all. And I think this is a very important insight into Russian foreign policy at that time. So this attempt by Russia to manipulate or appeal to Christian opinion in the Ottoman Empire, an attempt by Britain to restrict that, that influence in its own political agendas. <coughs> These matters come to a head in the Eastern Crisis to which I have already alluded, of 1875 to 8. And the Eastern Crisis, um, really a whole series of, of, of historical trends come, come together in confluence. Um, Bosnia and Herzegovina, large parts of Bulgaria, Serbia, are torn away from the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans, leaving the Ottoman Empire really with only a small sliver of territory there around Macedonia and Thrace. In that Eastern crisis too, Russia makes considerable military encroachments in the 1877-8 war in the Caucasus area in northeastern and in, in, through into northeastern Anatolia. During the Ottoman um, Russian War of 1877 to 1878, huge atrocities are, uh, are perpetrated against Armenians in the border region, particularly by Kurds. Uh, Kurdish forces, some of whom are in loose affiliation with government troops, some of whom are acting on their own initiative at a time of, um, uh, you know, uh, free time for, for action again, you know, exploitation, theft from Armenians, but also large-scale large famine rape and, and, and murder at that point too. 
the Eastern crisis also sees a massive influx of um, Muslim refugees from the Caucasus lands lost to Russia and from the um, Balkan lands that are seceding many hundreds of thousands of Muslim refugees themselves often experience, who have experienced considerable brutality at the hands of the secessionist powers and sometimes at the hands of Russian forces too, uh, are flooding into eastern Anatolia and well, the whole of Anatolia at this point. This it further agitates the situation for the indigenous Christian populations of eastern Anatolia. These refugees are themselves um, dispossessed, they themselves seek to dispossess and often take out, uh, seek vengeance on indigenous Christians within the Ottoman Empire as a sort of revenge for what they've been in, what they've received at the hands of other Christians in the Balkans and, 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 and at the hands of Russian forces. So they see the Eastern crisis brings together a whole host of a whole host of different historical factors, and you know, the common denominator of which ultimately is the suffering of Armenians in the eastern provinces. Now, this is not a new factor. You know, anyone who knows anything about the you know, late Ottoman history and the Armenian existence in eastern Anatolia will know that some of the, these factors in themselves are not new. What's new is the scale of the, of, of, I think, of Armenian suffering and victimisation at this point. This, uh, and this uh, really explains why it is that the Armenian question is brought to the international table at the end of that Eastern crisis. With the advance of Russian troops into northeastern Anatolia, um, and their appeal to the Armenian people, it becomes in the obvious tactical interest of Armenian leaders to respond to request protection from the increasing depredations which they're suffering in the Ottoman Empire itself. This causes concern for Britain, not only because Russia has already taken considerable territory in that region, but also because this, the idea of Russia being the sponsor of enforceable reforms um, for the Ottomans, of the Armenians of Eastern Anatolia, means that a further spreading of Russian influence even, even deeper into Eastern Anatolia. The notion that the Russians as was once suggested, would leave troops in eastern Anatolia to enforce reforms, enforce the reforms of security of life and property that the Armenians themselves wished for at this point. You know, this is really too much for Britain to bear, or mean, you know, an overt Russian political influence which has to be countered. So the British, as part of their bargaining and part of their attempt to push Russia back through the, from the whole of this, um, in the whole of the, uh, the, the settlement of, of, of the eastern crisis, Firstly, they contrived to restrict some of the independence of the, of the Balkan states, reducing the size of the newly independent Bulgaria, for instance. But they also contrived to um, restrict the, the, the reform to Armenians to a matter of paper promises alone, really. In the Treaty of Berlin itself, lip, you know, lip service is paid to reforms there within the treaty itself, but Britain is very careful to ensure that there's no enforceability for these reforms. You know, the notion of Russian troops being left in Anatolia to enforce these reforms completely out of the question. Britain's solution is to leave a few roving consuls at large to enforce this, the reform issue. Knowing, I think, well, knowing certainly that, 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 that this is going to be an ineffective thing, that this is a sop, an attempt to make Britain look concerned, an attempt to keep a certain amount of influence in the Armenian community away from Russia, keep it within the British scope, but also to try and keep Istanbul on board in a way too. In the aftermath of the Eastern crisis, the British commitment, such as it is, ebbs away yet further with the construction of the Suez Canal. Britain now has um, a very useful maritime route to the imperial dominion of India. The land routes to India become less significant concern about the precise integrity of Eastern Anatolia becomes less of an issue, but you know, the problem, the, the, the die is already cast in terms of this reform agenda, in terms of the restriction of the enforceability of reforms for life and property of the Armenians of Eastern Anatolia. And the British do not even really contrive, I think, to, 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 to placate the Ottoman leadership, because one of the 
huge and significant results of the Eastern crisis within the Ottoman Empire itself is to render the late Ottoman elite hugely suspicious of uh, international political constellations, full stop. Obviously, they're suspicious of Russia. Obviously, there's a huge and inherited historical enmity there. But Britain, too, having been, since the Napoleonic period, the main Western supporter of the integrity of the Ottoman Empire in its own interests, is now held as an object of suspicion. Because even though it hasn't actually pushed the reform issue, it's right, you know, it, it's, it's, it's paid sufficient lift service for it to keep the Armenian community of Eastern Anatolia interested, to keep them appealing to the great powers, to keep the idea of reform on the international table. You know, if only, in, if only notionally, and the Ottoman elite, under the new Sultan Abdul Hamid, who comes to power, Abdul Hamid II, who comes to power during the Eastern Crisis, is very cognizant of the example that Bulgaria's secession from the Ottoman Empire has set. Bulgaria's secession being partly based upon Bulgarian terrorist, terroristic nationalistic organizations, often um, performing ostentatious acts, trying to gain the attention of the outside world to the independence demands of the Bulgarians. It sided with an external Christian power, Russia, and it eventually got at least partial independence through the solution of the Eastern Crisis. From that point onwards, there's a model in the, uh, in the mind of the Ottoman elite about how Christian minorities within the Ottoman Empire are going to go about seeking independence. And the Armenians, with their reform demands, and reform demands they are alone at this point, not demands for independence. But nevertheless, the very fact that these demands have been um, it has been voiced through the form of an international treaty, bringing other powers into it is a sign of intrinsic disloyalty. Mm. This is why I think stress the internationalization of the Armenian question has been such a seminal point in, um, in, 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 in late Ottoman history as regards the Armenian question. We can build an awful lot of the dynamic leading up to the great massacres of the mid-1890s into that idea of internationalization. The Armenian political parties that are formed from the 1880s onwards, um, part of their agenda, a significant part of their agenda, is to reignite the Armenian question on the international stage. Again, attract attention to the ongoing plight of Armenians, particularly in eastern Anatolia. We know that the different Armenian political parties have very different agendas for what they would like, you know, whether this be simple reform within, within the Ottoman state, a more federated Ottoman state with greater autonomy or outright independence in some cases. But you know, what binds them together is their reference to, 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 to the reform issue. And this, in the mind of the late Ottoman elite, also binds them together to the outside world. Particularly when some of these, when Armen some Armenian nationalists start to engage in ostentatious acts and in, in some cases of terrorism, with the intent intention to draw the attention of the outside world back to this matter, this becomes an ever more sensitive issue without being entirely reductive, I think we can trace uh, the origins of the 1894-6 massacres as an attempt by the Ottoman state, to, you know, to what extent the Sultan Abdul Hamid is fully behind these, the, the idea of the massacre in Genesis is unclear, but we know that it proves of their general thrust when they're in, when they're in train. But what we see there is, there is, is a kind of state come so societal attempt to put the Armenians back in their place, as it were, to, to punish them to, for, for, the, for you know, the increasing nationalist activity of some, but more generally for the, for, for, for the whole question of, as, as, as the Ottomans, I think, see it, breaking the contract with the state by um, you know, forgetting that they're, they, you know, they're, they're really living on the sufferance of the state's protection as, as, as monotheistic non-Muslims, as Christians they are. They're living under the protection, but under the sufferance of the state too. And it's appeal to the outside world that somehow com compromise that status and need to be you know, punished. And I'd say punishment is what the 1894 to 6 is all about. Horrendous, mass murderous punishment. Not genocide. I mean, genocide you know, is, a is a different thing. I think it's like, well, I would draw the distinction between 1894 to six on one hand and 1915 to sixteen on the other hand. We can, we can, I mean, we can debate that. That's not necessarily very important at the moment. But just, just to, 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 and I think the evidence for the for the for the significance of the internationalization of the Armenian question on all those massacres in 1894 to six comes in 1895. Of course, the beginning of that series of massacres occurs at Sasun in 1894, but that, 
in itself is a relatively isolated, regionally conditioned thing, however horrific in scale. We often talk of 1894 to 6 as if it's one whole period. It's not really. It's actually three separate periods of massacre, by far the largest of which occurs from the final quarter of um, 1895 onwards. That's when the vast majority of Armenians killed in that period are killed. And I think there's this quite an obvious trigger point to, to that huge, uh, that huge kind of series of massacres that really sweep across the whole of Eastern Anatolia and then beyond. Uh, and that's, that would be in October 9, 1895, where in the aftermath of the Cecil of the Massacre, Britain, which has you know, re regained some of its ostensible humanitarian interest in the Ottoman Empire, presses for a reform commission, uh, enforceable reforms. Once again, you know, this idea of reforms comes up, investigations uh, uh, um, uh, are carried out, reform recommendations are made. In October 1895, Abdul Hamid acquiesces in, 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 in the demand for reform. And really it's within the very next few days that these massacres start to proliferate across the, across the country. Uh, and it almost is a direct result of, of this matter being raised once again, or perhaps of the humiliation of, of the Sultan being obliged to sign something promising an external power to look after his own people. You know, one of the great interventions in Ottoman internal affairs, it seemed to be. So internationalization, huge massacre that's in some quite close sense tied to internationalization. This I think is a dynamic that continues through the Young Turk period, the Committee of Union and Progress period, after 1908, after the 1908 Committee of Union and Progress coup, through the whole period up to and through the genocide period. Because although clearly the ideology of the Committee of Union and Progress is, is different to um, to that of the Hamidian regime. Some, some elements are more secular, some of them are more nationalist. We can't yet talk about fully fledged nationalism, but it's clearly different to, to the neoconservative um, religious quality of the Abdul Hamid regime. What, of course, those two regimes share, what binds them together more than separates them, is the desire to keep as much of the empire intact as possible. You know, they're really empire savers, all of these guys. And um, the key radicalizing event for the Committee of the Union and Progress um, is 1912 to 1913, the Balkan Wars. In the Balkan Wars, as what remains of the Ottoman territory in Europe is, is torn away, it, it, it really, this really ra raises many of the same issues that the Eastern Crisis raised in 1875 to 8. Once again, the loss of large tracts of territory in, um, in Europe, in the Balkans. Once again, the influx of hundreds of thousands of often brutalized Muslim refugees from the Balkans into the, what's left of the Ottoman Empire, which is you know, increasingly, as far as the Ottoman elite sees, it's only Anatolia. You know, the more territory it loses elsewhere, the more important Anatolia becomes as, in a reconfigured sense, the, 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 the heartland of the Ottoman Empire itself, which is kind of historically nonsense because tradition, the heartland of the Ottoman Empire being uh, the territory of, you know, of the eastern Mediterranean, particularly the, 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 the southeastern Balkans. But as the Ottoman Empire is pushed out of those territories, increasingly Anatolia itself has been reconfigured as the heartland, you know, the sort of seed there for a Turkic Muslim renewal in the future. Um, and it's becoming more and more Islamized in terms of the pop population with these Muslim refugees coming into it. Christians, in that sense, are becoming ever more and more anomalous in the empire. Whereas once this was a huge multinational, multi ethnic, multi religious empire, it's increasingly becoming Islamized, it's increasingly becoming, in some sense, Turkified too. Um, the, uh, and Christians are more and more anomalous and increasingly being seen by the very fact that they're Christians and have relationships with outside powers in some sense is inherently treacherous. You know, inherently treacherous. The Balkan War is this a hugely significant moment in radicalizing the mentality of the Committee of Union and Progress to something like a, a genocidal mentality. I think we can say. An idea that you know that in order to secure to secure the future of Anatolia, you need to make sure that 
the Christian populations within it are either marginalized so, so much that they're no longer significant politically or indeed you know, removed completely by one means or another. It's very noticeable that many of the elite, the Committee of Union Progress leadership who lead the uh, Ottoman Empire into the First World War and who are the key perpetrators of the genocide, many of these are people who themselves or their families have, are refugees from um, the Balkans. Thracians, Macedonians, a huge representation amongst the Ottoman elite of, of, of people who themselves or their families have been victimized or they see themselves as having you know, been, a, been affected by this great disaggregation, this great collapse of the Ottoman Empire and sort of rather perfidious role as they see it of the powers in, in all of this. The aftermath of the Balkan War brings one final version of the Armenian reform plan. As the um, treaty bringing the Second, World, uh, Second Balkan War to a close in 1913 is signed, with considerable Russian stimulation, Armenians' leaders once again appeal um, for external protection against the increasing horrors that they are experiencing within the Ottoman Empire. And we, you know, we're now talking about sporadic unpunished murders at an almost endemic level in the East. Huge ongoing land theft by some sedentarizing Kurdish tribes, but also by Muslim refugees from the Caucasus and from the Balkans too. Almost, an almost endemic level of suffering which is generally not addressed by the state itself because increasingly the CUP elite um, finds it not in its interests to address Christian grievances but it's more interested in appealing to the majority of Muslim constituents. Now, I think there's no doubt that Russia would have dropped this reform plan that it's prepared to sponsor in 1913 to 14. There's no doubt it would have dropped it if and when it had seen it as um, being in its interests. As it happens, the Armenian reform plan became an irrelevance anyway because of the outbreak of the First World War. One of the first things, of course, that the Ottoman state does upon its entry into the First World War is to abrogate the reform plan, um, repudiate the Ottoman public debt administration, repudiate the, the hated capitulations, these legal and fiscal privileges which are given to um, the European powers and their representatives. And in effect, a whole series of measures which reject all of these external impositions on the Ottoman Empire and which also reject the idea of protecting Armenians. In fact, Talat, the interior minister of the Committee of Union and Progress, actually says at the height of the reform negotiations in 1914 that he intends at some point to make, you know, to act in such a way that will make this whole reform question redundant for at least 50 years. You know, this is a threat, an obvious threat. I, I, I would contend that prior to the war, the fully-fledged genocidal intention is not quite there. Some of the thinking towards Armenians is genocidal. It takes the war to push it over the edge into genocide, just as it takes the war to push the Nazis into genocide in, in 1941. But so many of the ingredients are there. You know, this, this, this myth, you know, the, the libel of, 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 of collectively treacherous Armenians, this association of Armenians as a sort of inner enemy with great powers outside as an external enemy, all of these in place have classic ingredients for a kind of genocidal solution, they're there. Now, I said I won't talk about the genocide itself and its internal dynamics. I, I, I don't intend to. This is still about the great powers. I think what's interesting, if one's uh, concerned with you know, assessing the moral responsibility and historical responsibility of the great, the great powers, is to watch um, the way in which Britain responds, you know, having been so significant in in agitating this dynamic. It responds, I think, more or less in exactly the way you would expect, any seasoned Britain watchers would expect Britain to respond with considerable flux of fluctuation, vacillation, and not a small amount of bad faith. In the first instance, as the early massacres are happening from late 1914 and the early months of 1915, the British response or non-response to the to, to the news of the murder of Armenians and Assyrians is to say that, well, um, 
you know, we've still got our eye on imperial communications and the loyalty of the empire during war. The last thing we need to be seen to be doing is, 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 is making a fuss about atrocities by a Muslim state against Christians when we are worried about Muslim sentiment in India, particularly. You know, keep quiet because we don't want to exact, agitate the world's Muslims, especially since with German support the Ottoman Empire has, de has declared jihad in the autumn of 1914, holy war the, with the intent of, 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 of agitating the Muslims of the British and Russian empires against their rulers. There's a very, very good reason for keeping quiet, quiet about atrocities against Christians within the Ottoman Empire. And this position holds for the period of the main deportations in the summer and early autumn of, the, of 1915. In around, around September onwards, the British position changes and it changes because it sees that, okay, there is this danger about inciting Muslim opinion, but there are also some considerable benefits to be gained from invoking the Armenian genocide on the international stage. And the most obvious benefit they can think of is that talking about what's happening to the Armenians is a very good way of, not only of slurring the Ottoman Empire, but of slurring its ally, Germany, this in turn could be a very useful method for appealing to America, which is neutral at the time, uh, with the intention of bringing America into the war, a very important moral case for America to come into the war. So Britain suddenly decides that this is something it really needs to make a big fuss about. Much the same, well, a, a different series of dynamics occur in the aftermath of genocide, but before the war is over on the, on the uh, Russian Revolution in 1917. With the Russian Revolution, the collapse and retreat of what's left of the uh, Russian armed forces from the Caucasus area, the passage is really free for Ottoman troops and German troops to push through the Caucasus, they push through the ethnically cleansed lands of eastern Anatolia, push into the Caucasus and, you know, uh, and gain strategic ground there. And once again, threatening Central Asia, but also gaining a, a key territory around the Black Sea region, vital in the, for the war effort killing Armenians in the Caucasus as they go. Um, Britain is clearly concerned about this from a military strategic point, but it's also concerned about you know, possible um, Bolshevization of the British Empire to Bolshevik penetration of the imperial dominions. And it really appeals to the Armenians of the Caucasus, many of whom are refugees from eastern Anatolia itself and the genocide. Um, attempt to sort of stiffen their resolve and you know, make them fight on behalf of the Brits under a certain amount of British regional military leadership. You know, a plan which doesn't work for all sorts of obvious reasons. And, but as part of this effort to, to, to stiffen the fighting resolve of the army is make them fight in British interests. You know, this is where we start getting real lip service paid to the idea of an independent Armenian state in the aftermath of war. Uh, um, first lines of what later become the Sèvres Treaty are sort of drawn up in this period, you know, promising the Armenians something in return for more wartime and military service. But you know, the cynicism of this, um, of this promise, I think, is, is, is astonishing at the time. It's something which the Brits you know, may intend to realise if they, if they can, but it really doesn't matter to them if they can't. In fact, Lloyd George himself says all these promises or half promises are being made, just as they're being made to Arabs at that time. That, you know, these promises are to be held regarded as a war move rather than a peace move, i.e. a piece of you know, wartime tactics rather than a long-term strategic promise. The whole situation turns again in the aftermath of the First World War with the successful, from the, from the Turkish point of view, the successful Kemalist revival. The, um, nationalist movement under Mustafa Kemal Ataturk that um, fights off the Greek occupying forces and forces the Allies into revising the Sevres terms which they're attempting to for force upon the, um, the, Tur the, the late Ottoman Empire, the new Turkish state in the early 1920s. With the success of that, with the fait accompli presented by Kemal as he drives Turkey, uh, Greek forces out of Anatolia, the British once again clearly have to rethink their regional strategy. It takes <coughs> at least a decade, I think, to, to fully normalise relationships with, with the new Turkey, but nevertheless, there's a deeper rationale to the re-establishment of, of Turkey within British good books. Of course, this is a 
uh, a resurrection of the British stance as of the mid 19th century. The Ottoman Empire no longer exists, but Turkey is still there, and you know it's a much reduced Turkey, a Turkey in Anatolia, a vigorously nationalist but non-expansionist Turkey that's prepared to protect the integrity of its borders. In some ways, an ideal ally against um, Soviet Russia, Bolshevik Russia, against future Russian expansion. So, in a sense, the new Republic of Turkey takes the strategic place in the British worldview of um, the the old. Ottoman Empire. And the Armenian question, with that strategic shift in British thinking, really goes out the window once again. And, and you know, with, with, with a few nuances, I think this really explains British, the British position up to the present day, you know, even though the, the, the Soviet Union no longer exists. You know, having a secular minded, you know, relatively stable ally in the region that's achieve the nation state requisites supposedly of ethnic homogeneity and non-expansionism and stability, trading partners and so on. This is, you know, this, this, this is an important sort of part of the strategic constellation for Britain and the power which steps into Britain's shoes in terms of um, strategy in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East, the United States of America. I said I'd touch upon Germany. Now, this is, I will do this briefly because in a way I think I mean, one of the one of the finest historians of the genocide of Ahmed Adria. I think this is, this is I, I would, you know, respectfully disagree with him on this point that Germany is, has a direct responsibility in the Armenian genocide in the sense of supporting it, even coming up with the idea for it. I think what we can say about Germany in the genocide period is this: absolutely never going to intervene meaningfully on behalf of the Armenians. It's prepared to let Armenians die as a result of. You know, keeping the war alliance together. That doesn't mean it supports the idea, but it's, it's not going to oppose it. I think that's where, that's where it fits much more typically into the pattern established already by the other powers, by Britain and Russia. Um, when Germany re really appears on the scene in the 1890s in the Ottoman Empire, it makes a kind of tacit pact <coughs> with, with, the, with the late Ottoman elite during the massacres of the 1890s. Um, during the massacres of the 1890s, you know, German missionaries do lend some assistance to, to, to Armenians in the eastern provinces and yeah. elsewhere. But there's a very, a very important distinction is made, I think, in the German official mind between this sort of humanitarian assistance on one hand and political intervention on the other. You're allowed to intervene humanitarianly in the sense of aid, but you're not you're allowed to intervene politically because that will put you in the ranks of Britain and Russia. And we've already seen that Britain and Russia by this time have kind of blotted their copybooks with the late Ottoman states. So if Germany is looking for economic advantages in the Ottoman Empire, has an awful lot to gain from disavowing any political interest in the Armenian question at all. And that's what's going on with Germany. And it's that precisely that dynamic I think, that, that takes it into the set, into the First World War. Even as the genocide is going on, you, know, you do see some German missionaries helping Armenian refugees. You do see you know, some consuls pressing the um, German ambassador to make a protest to to Berlin, in turn to make a protest to the CEP leadership. But you know, it's this continuation of this of this important distinction between humanitarian aid on one hand and diplomatic pressure or uh, diplomatic intervention on another. The last thing that the, that the Germans are going to do is, is 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 lose their favourable status in the eyes of the Ottoman elite by pressing the Armenian issue. And that I think would explain really what's what's going on with the Germans during the, during the First World War. So, you know, so I you know, I'd say you know, we, need to, we need to create create a nuance there between kind of passive acceptance and active support for the genocide. Now, in closing, just a few words about the United States of America, simply because it's you know, its historical responsibility in this whole question is much less than all of these other powers. It's, it's not a significant player in the region while the genocide is happening. Significant, by the way, that it never declares war on the Ottoman Empire, despite the, the talk in America of this being, you know, the war itself being, you know, a moral crusade of sorts. But America's historical responsibility in the area is slight up to this point. It has no responsibility, really, in the agitation of relations which lead to genocide. What it does do, however, is in the aftermath of the First World War, it does something like what Germany does and comes in 
and seeks advantage, particularly commercial advantage, in the Ottoman Empire of Turkey in the aftermath of the massacre, as Germany had done in the 1890s. You know, I think it also makes the same sort of tacit agreement with itself and with the, and with, and with the new Turkish Republican elite that it itself, you know, we've still got some missionaries doing some good work there. There's a huge concern for the missionary infrastructure in, in, in the Ottoman Empire. We know that a lot of American missionaries, consuls, do good work during the First World War itself. But just as America did not to you know, consider really declaring war on the Ottoman Empire during the First World War, in the aftermath, with the disappearance of the large Christian communities of the Ottoman Empire, with the fact this is now you know, a vigorously secularizing you know, Turkish nationalist regime is in power. There's no, you know, they're, they're, I, think, I think Americans see no advantage at all being made in pressing the issues of you know, the territorial settlement, commemoration of the mass, because this is you know, precisely the sorts of dynamic that leads to the quashing of the Metro Goldwyn Mayer project for filming the 40 Days of Musadag in the 1930s. You know, State Department pressures it because there's nothing to be gained from America in this, in this area anymore. This notion that you know, the spurious notion that you can entirely dissociate humanitarian concerns from political ones, as if those two things uh, exist separately in the, political, in the political sphere. So what we ultimately see, um, particularly in the, in the period around the Second World War, as the British Empire mercifully <coughs> comes to its conclusion um, and is replaced as a hegemon <coughs> in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Near East and everywhere else by the United States. In the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, you have these patterns all having been set into play in the interwar period, you know, the huge um, solicitousness that Britain develops the Turkish nationalists, the, American also, the Americans also share. They think this is a regional ally with which they can do business. Someone who speaks their you know, language of modernization, secularization, you know, in stark contrast to kind of the religious hordes elsewhere. This is, you know, a, a profoundly important strategic decision is made and only reinforced in the aftermath of the Second World War by the expansion of the Soviet Empire into Eastern Europe. Turkey, of course, along with Greece, is one of the countries who, you know, whose, whose future is central to the enunciation of the Truman Doctrine in 1947. Along with um, Iran and Afghanistan, Turkey is held to be the central, you know, one of the three central or core countries within the so-called northern tier of states, of sort of hopefully pro-American states, well, they didn't do that well in Iran and Afghanistan, but they, you know, hopefully American states that will act as a buffer against um, southward expansion for the Soviet Union in the aftermath of the Second World War. You know, precisely the same dynamic that one might see with the British and their concern for maintaining a Central Asian buffer zone against um, Imperial Russia in the 19th century. And this is the dynamic which I think is established early in the century, is fortified mid-century, and I think continues into the present day. Despite you know, the downfall of the Soviet Union, we now have other regional enemies against which um, the secular, secularist, um, you know, nationalist Republic of Turkey is a useful counterpoint and a model of, of, of you know, how we would like to order the world in that region, and of course the Armenian question, as ever, falls between the floorboards. Thanks. I expect Professor Blossom will entertain some questions. You didn't mention the uh, independent republic at all. My father was consul. Most of those people, who was, those who did escape, often were in our home. The generals, I remember one of the generals said, we went there to die, but we were shocked we were able to defeat them. They had a complete independent republic for two years. Established universities, established court system, and totally ignored. You didn't mention anything about it. I don't know why. Sure, sure. Yeah. And just purely the interest of time, really. I, yeah, I think yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's a really important point you raise. And it uh, sounds like you could talk rather more authoritatively about it than I could. Um, I mean, the, 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 that's it's 
it's a period of clearly of, of, of hope at, at one level uh, and you know desperation at another. But I, I think I tend to agree with. Um, I think Ron Sumi who writes on this that you know what what's going on in that period there is is a kind of lacuna before normal great power relations are established. You know, while the Russian Empire is mutating into the um, the Bolshevik Empire, you know, it temporarily retrenches, retreats, does it? You know, is not expressive of itself. The Ottoman Empire is metamorphosing into the into the new Turkey at the same time. This is a period of relative weakness for both of those huge regional players, and in that time, in that time, there is space for other smaller polities to, to grow and exist. But you know, I think, in terms of the big picture that I was painting, you could almost say that it, states like the Independent Republic of Armenia are almost inevitably doomed as soon as the big powers either side of them start to reassert themselves. And of course, in that period, the real problem comes with the fact that Turkey and Bolshevik Russia effectively make an agreement to bring the Republic of Armenia to an end. So, you know, it's, it, again, once again, just falls into that kind of the interstices of a, mu of a much bigger power system. You don't mention Churchill at all. What was like to say about him? Churchill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think yeah. he's the person behind the grand design. You mentioned, mentioned Lord George. I remember there were British aircraft in uh, Egypt at that time. And they let that rot there rather than let the Armenians have it. And I also, the Second World War after that, it was Churchill who gave Pol Catholic Poland to Stalin. He was the most powerful player, I think. Well, I think that with. Oh, sure, yeah. Sorry, I quit after that. The, the question was, was, was uh, about, well, at least in part, about Churchill's role as a kind of. As an important British player in dictating this court, you know, the course of events. Well, he is, of course, important. Yeah. But you know, the, the other regional players there are important. I mean, Churchill is, you know, he's held up as being a realist at this time in British foreign policy. Someone who realizes quite early in the day that Britain is going to have to come to terms with, 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 with Turkey because of, you know, simply because of the regional dynamics. He's and he's also extremely anti-Bolshevik, so he sees that. You know, he's a very early proponent of this idea, which is why he seems not to be on the side of the Armenians. This is just another illustration of the fact that there's no point thinking about one side or other. It's just interests, interests always. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, back. Do I say want to eliminate the Armenians? I mean, particularly, I would want to have that happen. Well, it happen. What, why, why did who want to be? Why did the Armenians have to be eliminated? In, in, in the Republic, or? Yeah. Well, well I, I think by that time, I, it's clearly the, the, you know, in part a simple territorial matter. Um, the, the Ottoman and the Turkey continue keen to return to the boundaries of 1878. This is always very big in his mind. Return to the boundaries of 1878. No, not, not much further, but that, the boundaries. Um, the Bolsheviks ultimately keen to reinsert themselves regionally. I mean, the, the Bolsheviks aren't interested in killing Armenians, they're just interested in removing Armenian independence and absorption. The, 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 the Kemalist army that drives into the Caucasus is, is certainly interested, at least in killing a lot of Armenians and enslaving quite a lot of others with its military operations. But. Yes, sir. Thank you for a very good lecture. Uh, my question is from the Armenian perspective. If you look at this whole history of the Armenians and the Turks uh, from the second half of the 19th century to early 20th century. Uh, do you think the Armenians could have done anything to prevent the genocide, short of, say, uh, being uh, Islamicized or Turkishized or eliminating themselves as a Christian minority? Yeah, the, 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 thank you. Uh, the question was, from the, the mid-19th century when this dynamic really starts to build up, is there anything the Armenians could have done short, short effectively of, 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 of forcibly assimilating themselves to prevent, to prevent genocide? Well, it's, uh, this is a, it's a very good question. You know? I can't really pretend to have an answer. I, I think that what I would say is that there can always be a danger in, in, in situations like this, and I think maybe I sometimes 
fallen foul of this myself, of thinking that ultimately the victims can have more of a say in what... You know, it's very often politically correct these days to talk about agency you know, and re-empowering re people by reference to what they can or can't do in certain situations. In some situations, quite clearly, the power disparity is so large that there is almost nothing that one can do. Um, you know, the Armenians, are, are beyond a point, are not arbiters of their own destiny. Um, and, and so, I mean, I, what I would say is that the contingent element of this, or there's a huge contingent element in this, is not it doesn't really pertain to the Armenians. The contingent element pertains to the policy choices of the late Ottoman elite, the particular way that great power constellations play out. You know, it's, there's a possibility up until very late in the day that the Ottoman Empire would have entered the war on the other side. You know, if the, if the Ottoman Empire had entered the war on the side of the Allies, you know, Britain and Russia, well, you know, we'd never, we'd not have had an Armenian genocide. Um, you know, I suspect we'd have had a kind of continuation of this ongoing practice of kind of, you know, s stealing from the Armenians, encouraging them to leave somehow, you know, being, you know, some forced assimilation. But, you know, th those are where I would build the elements of contingency in. I, I think that in the scope of normal political activity beyond some sort of bizarre policy choices that no human group would ever have made anyway. I, you know, I know I don't think there is anything else we have done. Can you comment on... No, that's okay, go ahead, John. Can you comment on France during this period? Yes, I was going to um, say that. The question was, could I comment on France during the period? Um, yes, yeah, I didn't, didn't pay much attention, but no attention to France. Um, Quite right, too. Uh, <laughs> and France's role is um, secondary, definitely. Um, despite you know some mid 19th century attempts to kind of re reassert itself on the international stage, France's role is, is is decidedly secondary. Where it has, I think, greater influence is in is in Cilicia. Yeah. Um, um, you know, a, a greater cultural influence certainly. Uh, the, the proximity of some important French consulates. Um, you know, some ongoing cultural ties in that region too. Um, French, France's influence, influence amongst the Greek population is probably at least as great actually. There are there's some interesting dynamics going on there during wartime. Um, I think, I mean, the French policy is, is, is not dissimilar to Britain, British policy for most of the war. In the first instance, they, the French too are a little worried about agitating Muslim opinion in you know, French colonies. Um, but for the most part, it, it's it's interested really in, insofar as it, you know, insofar as it's interested in you know in the region and pressing its influence in southeastern, south sorry, southwestern Anatolia and Cilicia. And so, seen from the, the Ottoman perspective as being much less an important part of the dynamic. Certainly, as it kind of gets involved with you know the, the Armenian Legion in the second half of the war, it comes more onto the Ottoman radar as being you know a, an ally of the Armenians. But by that point. You know, the, the genocide itself has largely happened, so I wouldn't really put the French as being an important part of the big dynamic building up to genocide. I mean, if one of thinks of the reform plan of 1914, this is primarily a, a matter for negotiation between Germany and Russia by that point, so even Britain has pulled a little bit further out, its historical responsibility is still big. France isn't primarily involved in that process, so it's a relatively small role, I would say. Here, and Yes. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm also a student of the Spearbit. I studied at LSU with David Stevenson, whom I'm sure you know of his. And I think there was no way for the young Turks to enter the war on the side of the Antan. And this was the main predicament. I mean, you know, it was, there were at least six instances which they go and ask to become a member of the Antan and ask assurances of all sorts. It never happens. In, in, in May 1914, there was this last attempt at Livadia when the Tsar went there, uh, uh, went there, and again nothing happened. And it, there was an explicit letter from Gray stopping the Russians to conclude an agreement of sorts with the Ottomans. So I think this was the main predicate. And I, I wouldn't be able to agree that they had a choice in so far as their choice of which side they would take. 
No, they, they didn't have heard. it also yeah. a choice in not going becoming a neutral because they didn't have any power to sustain themselves as neutrals. And I think uh, this is one important point. I think it's very important. Yeah, very important point. So yeah, I'm sorry if I gave the impression that you know this was an option that was that was that was open to the Ottomans. Obviously, it wasn't after. Once the British had said no, but it was, it was it was something that was on the table from the Ottoman perspective. Oh, yes, and had yes. that been taken up by the British, we, we're not going to have a genocide. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions. Uh, first, uh, the uh, Foreign Office uh, published the Blue Book, which I think we are very familiar with, which actually details almost daily uh, incidents that uh, happened. Uh, why did that publication never saw light again and the British government basically tries and ignores its existence? Well, I, uh, did, did everyone hear that? No. Okay, the question was uh, the, 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 night, the, the blue book published by uh, Arnold Bryce and... Uh, uh, sorry, Arnold Toynbee and James Bryce in, in 1915. Um, why did you know, that appear and then sort of disappear in British official discourse? Why? Well, it's. I mean, it, it's interesting. You know, the re-edition of this, of course, is, is you know, Alice Serafi. Yeah, yeah, and this is. I mean, I think. I think. You know, I don't really like to be fair to the British, but the, you know, I, I, the, they have at least you know said that this was a faithful document. I mean, they're still hedging around the genocide work, but they've said that this is a faithful document which was drawn up at the time, which of course it was. I mean, but the, the problem was it was also a propaganda document. I mean, you can have something which is both true and propaganda. And, and that's what it was. Um, and so the fact that it was always brought up in that in that circumstance in late 1915, when it was partly being used to help draw America into the war, was always a sort of slight cause of concern from the British perspective, because it clearly was a piece of war propaganda, even though everything in it, or 99% of everything in it, was 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 reliable. So you know, I, I think that the, what that doesn't do, of course, is, is is in Britain is clarify anything about the use of the G word, because. It didn't exist at that time, and you know, there was no way that, that that could be then used as proof of British recognition of the idea of genocide. That could only be used as proof of the idea that the British recognised that massacres were happening. Um, so, you know, I, I think on that one, the British, I, in, in that case, you know, it's not necessarily a, a significant cause for criticism of Britain, but uh, you know, there are plenty of other causes. My second question is. Uh, uh, you said that uh, the reason that Britain was not really interested that much in, uh, uh, from a humanitarian point of view in the Armenian cause of genocide is because the concept of uh, uh, state was everybody in the state was subject rather than, as we understand it today, being a citizen, which means that the, uh, the state can do whatever they want to, to the subjects rather than protect them as citizens. Well, I, I don't think that's necessarily a fun. Sorry, the, the question was: you know, did, did British reaction or non-reaction to the issue of genocide pertain to the fact that the Armenians were seen as sul subjects of the Sultan uh, rather than citizens, which would somehow affect their status uh, um, in terms of whether this was a matter for purely in, uh, internal affairs or for external intervention? I don't think that subject-citizen dichotomy is important there. It's, well, I mean, there's no difference in international law between, I think, between in, in this regard, between whether someone's a subject or a citizen. The important question is is whether um, heads of state uh, and their representatives can be held accountable for acts committed against anyone within their you know, within their territory, citizens, subjects, or otherwise. Of course, at the time this was happening, this was you know, this is a, 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 an early point in the development of these sorts of concepts, an important point in the development of these concepts too. You know, it's no accident that when, in May 1915, under Russian pressure, Britain and France and Russia make a declaration about the ongoing crimes against humanity in the Ottoman Empire, that they use those words. You know, that formulation, I think the first time that's ever used in an international, um, in, in international political sense is important. You know, they're trying to say this is something of general concern to humanity, um, that I mean, it just kind of slips in there actually, because in the first instance it's crimes against Christians, but you know, they reformulated crimes against humanity. Mm. And, you know, something of, of, of sufficiently general concern because of its of its magnitude. You know, the normal arguments of state sovereignty don't necessarily obtain. Hence, we get all these abortive trials afterwards. You know, what, I mean, we, we, we do have some Turkish 
prosecuted trials in Istanbul and elsewhere, you know, and the possibility of, of, the, of the British even trying some of these people. So, I mean, clearly, you know, the argument that the states have, you know, full internal authority is, is a significant and well-established one. But even by that time, even before this is formally codified in international law, as it is at Nuremberg, that states can't just do anything to their citizens. You know, the, the, these conceptions of, 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 of kind of a moral sanction are already there. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had the outrage that we had in the 1890s against about the massacres going on there. People may not have legal mechanisms to fall back on them, but they've definitely got the sort of moral force, which is an important you know, constituent factor of international relations also. You know, probably, probably even more important, even today, I think, than the legal sanction. One, two, three. Yeah. Your model of a high versus power uh, is a pretty pessimistic outlook for uh, the, the ambulance here. Okay. As you come to uh, play the game of these powers with each other, do you have any vision of what remnants of the Armenian power can, what it can play in its future? Soft question. So, okay, okay. Given, given the horrendous, you know, given, given the kind of real politic nature of my analysis, you know, which is effectively about power constellations outweighing small powers, you know, what, what future for Armenia and its, let's say, power agenda? Well, I think I probably build the answer to that question in from the answer, my answer to the, the previous question. So, you know, where, you know. My analysis, you know, the real politic analysis is too crude. I use it because it's an interest, it's a good way of elucidating the problem. But of course, you know, pure power is not everything in international relationship, relations. Moral force does have a role, a mitigating role, a constituent role in some way. You know, I, I would argue it's small, but it's probably growing, you know, unevenly, etc., etc. But the most important thing, I think, is that it's, it's to stop thinking in the power terms. I, I remember someone saying, to, I was in Lebanon a couple of years ago, and I remember some, an Armenian friend of mine saying, you know, what we had to hope for was some sort of, you know, military, you know, some sort of, some sort of catastrophe for Turkey in some sense, so, you know, Armenia could re-expand, you know, and, and, and you end up playing exactly the same sort of power game, which is really just, led to, you know, where, it's very difficult, and I, you know, I'm not an Armenian. I'm not a member of the Armenian community. I can't, you know, I don't want to go beyond my remit here and, and suggest things. But it seems to me that where where the where power in inverted commas is to be is to be exercised, it's at that level of a more moral authority. One would one would hope, which you know, which means you know, to, to pressing the issues of um, you know the freedom of speech question in in, in, in Turkey, certainly. You know. With, by which, you know, hopefully discussion about the genocide will open up. But of course, you know, there's this huge issue of the, the border blockade and, and you know, the things which are really beyond our money is capacity to, 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 to you know, to, 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 to arbitrate on their own, I, th I think, in the face of bigger powers. But there are people in this room, you know, who, who know so much more about this than I do, that I can't really go into the contemporary politics without saying something that will just make me look stupid. <laughs> Well, I'll talk pretty mentally on freedom of speech issue in Turkey. I sort of like to use the speech of freedom of speech issue in the United States. Apparently, your book got the uh, um, chairman of the Institute of Turkish Studies fired a year and a half ago. Uh, you had a comment on that? Um, sure, sure. The, 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 the observation was that, that my, um, I was talking in idealistic terms a few minutes ago about freedom of speech in Turkey. And, Clearly, there are freedom of speech issues in the United States too, as regards the, this, this issue by extension. Because a, um, a professor of a, a, you know, a very eminent Ottomanist um, at the University of Binghamton in New York, Donald Kater, um who was head of the Institute, Institute for Turkish Studies, based in DC, reviewed my, reviewed my book. I think at the end of 2006, and in its you know, said that he thought that genocide, you know, the, the United Nations definition of genocide, was an applicable thing for what befell the Armenians in, in the First World War, and, and subsequently, as a result of that, of writing that, was 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 um, was made to resign from his position as head of the Institute of Turkish Studies, which is primarily an organisation run, funded by the, I think, partly yeah, funded, well, at least in part by the Turkish government, but also with. with charitable status, so it means it can accept donations from others too. 
uh, which funds you know historical and other and cultural and other forms of research in this is the nice way of putting it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, clearly this is a huge unacceptable, you know, the fact that the head of this institute can be removed by effectively by direct political pressure from the Turkish embassy, ultimately from the Turkish government, is of course, you know, absolutely scandalous. I and um, I, I, don't, I don't really know what else to, to say about this apart from just to, you know, I mean, I, I think I think it was a bold, well, obviously a brave thing for, for the, the reviewer in, in question to do. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I, this has only really recently come to the surface in terms of public discourse. So I mean, it happened, and the actual dismissal happened probably a year ago. But I think that, you know, this is this study. You know, it would be interesting to see what happens. But I mean, it's obviously disgraceful. Um, I sort of, I, other than moral outrage, I can't really. Shall we talk difference of outrage? No, I know, you know, that fact plus, plus the fact that it didn't take a year and a half for it to come out. <laughs> well, I think, I, think the only, I think the reason it came out just now was because the Middle Eastern Studies Association, of which Professor Quartet is, a, is an eminent member, finally got around to agreeing at a meet some one of its court, their forums to, 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 to write a kind of joint letter by a lot of prominent, you know, its prominent members to the Turkish, uh, to the Turkish Prime Minister. So, you know, out outlining their protest against this, and some of the names, signatories to this letter were actually very interesting. Well, uh, uh, the letter which the Middle Eastern Studies Letter wrote, uh, Association wrote to the Turkish Prime Minister, you know, amongst their, amongst some of the signatories were some of the more prominent deniers. All the way in the back. I wanted oh, to get back. Oh. That's okay, Barbara. Go ahead. I wanted to get back to the great powers. Um, you trace the role of Great Britain up until World War I very clearly. But I'm wondering, once 1914 came, could Great Britain have done anything different? I mean, after all, it was the Lippoling. They tried very hard to defeat Turkey. Seems to me they were not in a position then to do anything, and that really Germany was the only power that really was in a position to do anything. Now, I'm not trying to compare responsibility, but was there anything Great Britain could have done differently at that point? Thank you. The yeah, sure, sure. What's the Great Britain have done? Sure. Oh, yeah. I guess you must have all heard that? Yeah. No. Yeah. No. I'm not sure. uh, is there anything else that Great Britain could have done during the war to, 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 to ameliorate what was going on? It, 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 no. But no, I mean, beyond, I mean, I, I suppose more, the more funds that were provided to you know, re you know, relatively well disposed Arab tribes. You know, more money that could have been possibly channeled through um, you know, the Russian authorities into the for refugees in the Caucasus. I mean, there's a, a fairly famous instance I think in late 1915 when um, the British actually, you know, they do give some money but are reluctant to give more uh, because they can't publicly publicly um, advertise that they're giving it. You know, if it's going through sort of clandestine. Funds there, they don't want the, well, the Ottoman Empire to find out about this. They can't advertise it, so it can't serve the propaganda purpose. You know, of Britain helping the starving Armenians. You know, that sort of that level of kind of helping the victims. A little more could have been done. But in terms of the, the big politics, no. I mean, in, in the damage Britain has done in that sense has has, has been done probably years ago by that point. Russia, I think, probably still does a little bit of damage even earlier into the war, but that's a different story. But yeah, I mean, Germany's the, the big player at that point. One, two. One, two, please. Yeah, all right. No? Okay, fair. Uh, I can clearly see the United States' interest in not recognizing the genocide uh, in their interest in Turkey today. Uh, could you tell me what is England's interest right now in that region? That not, uh, they are not recognizing the genocide. Uh, did you all get that? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, the, the question could see the, um, the United States' interest in um, placating Turkey in the present um, as regards the genocide issue and record. But why, why, why does Britain still have that position of? Still, why does it still share the American position even though, I mean, well the answer is it's still, I mean, most of the answer is the, the, the close identification of British foreign policy with American foreign yeah. policy. I mean, there's, you know, that's, that's really been there in one form or another since 1945 and, and with fluctuations. And, and um, 
Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's 90% of the answer. I mean, that there are definitely important trading contracts that are you know, significant in this too. Turkey is a very substantial market. Um, um, yeah, yeah. And I think there are, there are also, you know, within Britain, there are some voices who I think are, are being, I mean, I think are, are probably, mis I think they're misguided, but I think, I think they're being genuine in saying that this is something with which, you know, we don't, we, we no longer have a role in, <laughs> unfortunately, I wish they'd discovered, discovered before the genocide they shouldn't have a role in messing around other people's affairs, but I think, you know, that, that subsequently, I think you know, amongst some voices, there is, a, you know, at least a genuine concern that, British intervention over the issue of recognition will do more harm than good. You know, I think a lot of these third party things, if, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem. It's a problematic idea because, of course, the Ottoman Empire, I mean, Turkey has become so sensitized to external intervention in its affairs as a result of the factors we've been talking about that, you know, this issue of kind of genocide recognition in the present day can effectively seem like, you know, external great powers beating Turkey over the head again, you know, which is a terribly unfortunate legacy of, of the whole relationship dynamic in the first place. But but as I say the majority of the answer would revolve around, you know, Brit Brit Britain, you know, still sticking to the tenets of foreign policy it more or less established, but now someone else has entirely taken over. Okay, we got a couple more. Uh, one, two, three. You're gonna get my answer. Ten, four. Uh, Turkey has four. Roger, why don't you go? All right, yeah, I, I wanted to go back to what George had brought. Why don't you wait for the train? Sure. <laughs> I watch. Sure, hop on. Um, I'm interested in the occupation of Cilicia, the British were occupied after the, 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 the British and then the French occupied afterwards, they, they exchanged. Um, the Armenians, it's a sensitive topic for Armenians from that area. They, they actually hated the French as much as the Turks, I heard. More. And, uh, right? More. More. Because they, in the middle of the night, they left the Armenian population. More. Now, there was a rivalry between the British and the French after World War I, and can you comment on that. I don't know a lot about it, but I know that they, there was a rivalry that seemed to come more into play after the war, now that they were no longer allies in the war. Yeah, um, the question was pertaining to Anglo-French imperial rivalry in uh, Cilicia, and also you know, ar around the issue of the, op the, the occupation of that area in the immediate aftermath of the First World War, and the gradually differing British and French agendas. Well, you know, you've, you, you've got it right. There's I mean, that, that, that imperial enmity is always there, the imperial competition. It's more or less kept at bay during the war, but, you know, the, the whole dynamic of the late Ottoman Empire, really, is a question of all of the European powers trying to work out their orientation toward, you know, what happens when the Ottoman Empire falls apart. And in a sense, they have the wartime plans for the division of, of the Ottoman Empire, the site Pico, Sazanov plans, etc. Those are really, you know, just an intensification of those long-established concerns. You know, how do we divide up the Ottoman Empire and cause minimal friction amongst us as, as, as a great power collective. So, you know, although Britain and France are in a wartime alliance, some of the ongoing factors of them being imperial competitors are still there. And as soon as the war's finished, you know, those, you know, those, that, that, those differences re-emerge. And um, France, I think, opportunistically sees very earlier in the day that Britain, that it can uh, come to terms with uh, with Turkey, perhaps because it has less of a historical investment there in any case, but also because it sees it as a useful way to kind of, I, th I think, probably partly undermine Britain. You know, France pulls out of the idea of you know, supporting the, the ongoing Greek occupation, certainly the Greek thrust into Anatolia in 21, which is a catastrophic move anyway. Um, the, you know, the French have, have kind of, you know, given up that, you know, are coming to terms, and, you know, and, and, and then, you know, the, the, the way in which they pull out of Cilicia and Marash, you know, during that time is just an expression, a very opportunistic, opportunistic expression of, of the larger opportunistic moves that go around that, that post-war settlement. Thank this you. might be a good time for me to ask everyone to turn off their cell phones during yeah. tonight's lecture. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, better late than never. Okay, a couple, couple, couple more and then we'll, we'll cut it off. Yes. Uh, one question. Um, you mentioned back in 18, uh, anyway, the international treaties when the Army requests or desires were internationalized, I suppose at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and that Turkey took some, I guess, insult from that, so to speak. Um, and that what I'm drawing from this is that we were basically victims of circumstance that Turkey was trying to secure its country, its safety, and yet, but the Armenians somehow gained international 
level of, of whatever. Um, and that jeopardized the Armenians. Is that safe to say that Turkey was trying to secure its country yes. because of this element that had the possibility of maybe creating problems, or it looked like it might create yes. problems? So that, in essence, when Turkey accuses Armenians and saying, well, you were becoming revolutionary and rebellious, that's what, I mean, they actually use that as one of the reasons that they did the mass murders. Yes, the, the, the question was, uh, apropos of my discussion of this internationalization of the Armenian question in 1978, you know, do, do, to what to what extent, I think you're asking, is, you know, do, the, do the Ottoman elite genuinely think that the Armenians now compromise, com comprise a complicity? A, 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 a threat somehow to Ottoman territorial integrity. Well, yes, yes, they, yes, they do. I mean, it's. I think it's very important in getting into the minds of people who commit crimes that they actually genuinely believe they have a reason to. Who caused that international level of? Uh, you know? Well, I, 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 this again is what I mean. The, the Armenians here. If we're looking at you know the, what, the deeper cause of this, you know, the Armenians fall victim to a dynamic that really is not started by them. You know, has very little to do with them until late in the century. It's, this is a dynamic which is firstly about all Christians in the Ottoman Empire. You know, which is a way about you know the 1839 and 1856, the famous Tanzimat reform decrees. You know, particularly 1856, that's heavily pushed by Britain because the idea is that. You know, the Ottoman Empire has lost Greece, it's lost Serbia, it's obviously kind of weak because of its multinationality. And if you want the Ottoman Empire to be strong, as a, as a, as a kind of bulwark against Russia in particular, but also so you don't create all the problems of the Ottoman Empire falling apart, then the Ottomans need to do something towards their minorities. They need to offer a, a you know, so the, the kind of, the, the, the moves towards equality of the mid-19th century are, you know, partly a British suggestion, but partly coming from the Ottoman elite itself, are moves towards offering something to the Christians um, to tie their future in with the Ottoman Empire. They're not pro-Christian reforms because the Ottomans want to be nice to Christians. They're kind of pragmatic measures to mean that, you know, the empire will become a stronger, more cohesive unit and these people won't want to secede. And because secession is becoming the pattern, and particularly in the Balkans. Now, the funny thing is, you know, this is a time which the Armenians are still known as the, you know, the loyal community, the loyal millet, and you know, they're, they're, they develop nationalist se separatist aspirations late, and generally as a result, in the sense of many of the experiences they've, they've undergone in the, in the late Ottoman Empire. So, you know, the Armenians really are falling into this thing, a dynamic which has been created by other people for other reasons, you know, it's only, and this is why I stress the internationalization of the Armenian question in 1878, because Christians generally mentioned in reform treaties before, but internet, the Armenians specifically being singled out, this, you know, this is a real kind of sign to you. So Turkey views that as an Yeah. Uh, this question has to do with the motives of Germany favoring the Turkish government. One of, one of the motives I read about some time ago by some of the historians is that Turkey, because they were being geographically blockaded by the Allied powers, saw, saw uh, they, they, they wanted to they wanted to know how they could expand their, their territory. And, and one theory was they could go through Turkey to get to the Middle East. What's your opinion about that? The question is, is, is to what extent um, Germany's relationships with the Ottoman Empire, friendly relations, are some like old relations full stop, are, con uh, are conditioned by a desire to uh, expand in the Middle East in a way that they couldn't expand in Europe because of the, the, the arrangement of states in Europe. It's a good question. I think the, the main driving force behind, America, behind German relations with the Ottoman Empire is, is an economic one. Uh, it's resource and market related, it's prestige related too, um, you know, and, and, and it's, and it's, uh, you know, it's clearly to do also with diplomatic influence. Behind that, however, is an assumption that, you know, the Ottoman Empire probably will fall apart at some point. You know, temporarily, Germany actually, between, between Britain stopping, you know, being supporter of the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century and then becoming again so after the First World War, you know, Germany is, is, is the main supporter of Ottoman territorial integrity for a while, but it's, I think it's predicated upon the assumption the Ottoman Empire will fall apart eventually, and if it does, and if and when it does, Germany is well placed to make sure it can, you know, get what it, what it wants. But, but for the, in the first instance, its interests are, let's say, they're definitely geostrategic, but they're not territorial. Back oil. Um, that, that too? Although, of course, you know, Baku at that time was, yeah, yeah, the Russian, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's there, yeah. All the way in the back. Yes. 
Chances will be greatly reduced. Okay. Yeah. Since, <coughs> since then, my question to you, sir, is since the great powers, going back, since the great powers brought this issue of reform to the Ottoman Empire, wouldn't you yourself put some blame on Great Britain, uh, Germany, and Russia collectively as the as the first instigators of what would become downwards? 70 years down the road or 65 years down the road as the ultimate tragedy. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Now you mentioned that you don't see potentially Germany or England, they were they were paying for their own interest at the given time, etc. etc. I maybe misunderstood you. I was hoping to hear that basically armies on their own, if there were no great powers, maybe then maybe they would have been under the Ottoman or Turkish rule today, which, which they are, a small portion of it. Maybe a million tragedy would not have happened. So we uh, you took yourself away to pay powers for, for, for indirectly being responsible. Let's think for a moment about Britain. I mean, the thing is, what's, what's, going, on, what's going on with Britain's British sponsorship of, of reforms in the 19th century is this. They're trying to keep the Ottoman Empire together. They keep it, you know, and you know, I'm making no moral judgments about whether the Ottoman Empire should have stayed together or shouldn't have stayed together, but I think this is, this is how it actually happened. The British wanted to keep the Ottoman Empire together, so they support it to a certain extent militarily, you know, that's what the Crimea and war is partly about. They support it financially, they support it diplomatically. Um, as a part of that process of keeping together, they established this strange dual faceted relationship with the, with the Ottoman Christians, particularly the Armenians. So, in keeping, while keeping the empire together and to a certain extent strengthening it, they're also at the same time, you know, creating tensions which they don't want to create, but inevitably do create between the Ottoman Empire and its Christian minorities. And because um, they unintentional, yeah, unintentional, yeah, unintentional, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. they want, they, I mean, the British want harmony. Yeah, the British want everyone, all the Ottoman peoples, to be wonderfully happy together. But of course, the logic of what they end up doing. You know, is is creates precisely the opposite, and and it's because of you know because of that and because the Ottoman Empire is almost artificially being kept together, you know, and, and kept artificially stronger than it might otherwise be, you know, the parts of it that might naturally have fallen off the edges, you know, are, are being kept together and then you know being made object of a suspicion which the elite itself to to maintain its you know its you know itself as it has been maintained. Then wishes to destroy. So you know you're, you're in a situation where you know the British are uh, 
you know, trying to have it both ways, and, and, and the end result, of course, is, you know, is, 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 is massive murder. Sir, sir, I think very much. I got mine. That's it. That's it. Yeah, that's okay.